You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, legendary volunteer for Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. <laughs> Hi, Jeremy. Am I, uh, am I a little young to be a legend? Well, your legend is still being forged, uh, even as we speak. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, I'll take it. <laughs> today is October 3rd, 2021, and this is episode 139 of Lighthearted. We'll be talking about Marblehead Lighthouse in Ohio, which will be celebrating its 200th birthday next year. But first, has anything interesting happened on this date in Lighthouse history, Cindy? Why, yes, I'm glad you asked. On October 3rd, 1999, Absecon Lighthouse in Atlantic City, New Jersey, was relighted after 66 years in darkness. It had been decommissioned in 1933, just a few years after it was converted to electricity. The restored lighthouse is open to the public. Yes, at 171 feet, it's the tallest lighthouse in New Jersey, and it has 228 steps to the top. It's also the third tallest masonry lighthouse in the United States. So, Cindy, our subject today is Marblehead Lighthouse in Ohio. I grew up near a different Marblehead Lighthouse in Massachusetts, so I always think of that one first. Uh, But the one in Ohio is one of the most uh, historic lighthouses on the Great Lakes. Cindy, please help me tell everyone about Marblehead Lighthouse and today's guest, Dennis Kennedy. Sure, Jeremy. Marblehead Lighthouse in Ohio is the oldest lighthouse in continuous operation on the American side of the Great Lakes. Today, it's a major historic attraction as part of Marblehead Lighthouse State Park. Funds were appropriated for a lighthouse at the entrance to Sandusky Bay on Lake Erie in 1819, and the limestone tower went into service in 1822. The lighthouse was known at first as the Sandusky Light. The name Marblehead didn't come into being until around 1840. By the late 19th century, larger ships in the area required deeper water, so shipping moved farther from the coastline. This meant that an increase in the visible range of the lighthouse was needed, and the tower was raised 15 feet to its present height of 65 feet in 1898. The light was automated in 1958. The Ohio Department of Natural Resources now owns the lighthouse tower, while the Coast Guard continues to maintain the active navigational light. The light's distinctive characteristic, with a green flash every six seconds, distinguishes it from other lights in the vicinity. The lighthouse is now part of the nine-acre Marblehead Lighthouse State Park. The Marblehead Lighthouse Historical Society operates a museum in the old Keeper's House with exhibits on the history of the lighthouse and the local area. Visitors can climb to the top of the lighthouse for spectacular views of Lake Erie and its islands. A replica of an 1876 life-saving station was completed on the park grounds in 2016. A renovation of the lighthouse tower was completed last year and most recently a new restroom building was constructed as a joint project of the state of Ohio and the Marblehead Lighthouse Historical Society. Marblehead Light Station is celebrating its 200th anniversary next year, and the annual Lakeside Marblehead Lighthouse Festival is coming up in a few days on October 9th. Our guest today, Dennis Kennedy, is the president of the Marblehead Lighthouse Historical Society. We are recording this on September 26th, and I had the pleasure of speaking with Dennis Kennedy just a couple of days ago. Let's listen to that conversation now. I'm speaking today with Dennis Kennedy, who is the president of the Marblehead Lighthouse Historical Society in Ohio. Thanks so much for being with me today, Dennis. You're quite welcome. You know, I grew up near another Marblehead Lighthouse in Massachusetts. Very different. Yes, <laughs> they very different. They couldn't look more different. Yeah. Marblehead Lighthouse in Massachusetts is a skeletal type tower, the only one of its type in uh, in New England. And uh, I've been to Ohio, but I have not been to your lighthouse. Uh, I really want to get there. It looks like, of course, it's one of the most historic lighthouses in the Great Lakes. Also looks like one of the prettiest lighthouses on the Great Lakes. So It's a pretty I, little park, really. Yeah. So I look forward to getting there. I promise I will. So let me just start by asking you, before we get into talking about the lighthouse and some of its history and so forth, how did you personally get involved with Marblehead Lighthouse? Well, I I live on a little island about five miles from the lighthouse, Johnson's Island, which has a whole different history because it was a Civil War prison camp. Uh, It's got a bridge in Causeway. It's about a mile offshore. 
Uh, my wife and I had a vacation home here since the mid 80s, boated here. And when we retired in 2002, uh, we were looking for things to volunteer for. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the Lighthouse Historical Society kind of grabbed me because they were trying to upgrade their museums. And I spent 25 years owning an exhibit company and working as a museum exhibit designer. So uh, I got drafted. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you, you had some uh, useful experience there. So I assume you've been very involved with the, uh, the, the installation of exhibits at the, uh, the museum yes. at the Lighthouse. So yes. we'll, we'll put that off for the moment. We'll talk about that in a little while. But I, I'd like to uh, talk a bit about the history of the light station. Uh, it is the oldest lighthouse in continuous operation on the American side of the Great Lakes. Correct me if I if I don't have that quite right, but I, I think uh, that's correct. Okay, yeah, uh, I believe it is as well. And uh, why was a lighthouse needed there uh, back around uh, 1820 when it was built? Well, in 1819, um, U.S. Congress decided that shipping traffic on the Great Lakes was increasing rapidly. And they authorized construction of a lighthouse on the south shore of Lake Erie, somewhere between the Grand River, which is east of Cleveland, and the Detroit River. That leaves about two thirds of the south shore of Lake Erie around that two thirds, probably a quarter. It gave a pretty wide range of, of locations. Sandusky Bay is probably the best natural harbor, certainly in the western basin. And it's surrounded on the north side by a pretty rocky shore and, and 24 islands out in the lake. So there were a lot of things to hit. And uh, what was uh, Sandusky Bay known for at that time? Actually, the town was Sandusky was then called Portsmouth. And ah. uh, <laughs> yeah, I live in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. There's I, a I know few... you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, timber was being uh, shipped out of this area, mostly for, for boat building, you know, the, had not started really the limestone quarrying at this point, but uh, farming and, and those kinds of things were, you know, those goods were being shipped around. Of course, in 1825, the Erie Canal opened and suddenly the markets from the Great Lakes became, you know, accessible on the East Coast. So that was a big boom shortly after the lighthouse was built. So uh, let's talk about some of the historic highlights of Marblehead Lighthouse. First of all, the, the height uh, of the tower today is not the original height of the lighthouse. Is that right? It started out at 50 feet high, about 25 feet in diameter at the base. It's all built out of native limestone that was quarried locally. There is a quarry in the park, and we're trying to ascertain right now whether that was the quarry that the, the limestone was quarried from. Uh, hmm. We're going to plan on developing that a little bit next year and opening it up so people can see what these early quarries look like. It had to be raised in height so the light would be seen farther offshore, right? Because larger ships needed to larger sail ships, farther from shore. Uh, the water here is not very deep. Even off the lighthouse, if you go out a quarter mile, it's still only about 20 feet deep. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very shallow end of the lake. And, uh, you know, as the ships got larger, they had to move out beyond the islands and the, and the light needed to be visible further out. And you got to raise the light to do that. So the uh, the lantern uh, of the lighthouse where that was actually relocated from some someplace else the the top section the lantern section the, the in 1898 they decided to raise it by 15 feet and mm -hmm. even as robust as that limestone structure was the uh, engineers didn't feel it would take the weight of the addition so they actually built a a brick liner inside the lighthouse and then raised that 15 feet above the stone. So it's actually two lighthouses in one. There is a place that you can see between the two, which is kind of strange, but uh, we're mm -hmm. not sure why they left that open. In 1899, I believe the Presque Isle light, what is now called the, the uh, land lighthouse was decommissioned actually for the second time. They took the entire steel structure at the top, uh, the railings apart, brought them to Marblehead and installed those on top of the new, newly raised tower. The mm -hmm. lens that we have is a, or had at that time, is a bivalve three and a half border lens that was mm -hmm. on display in the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair. It mm -hmm. was brought back here in 1904 and installed then in that, in that tower. If we could talk a little bit about the human history, are there any particular stories of the uh, the people, keepers and families? 
the original keeper, the first keeper, was Benijah Walcott, who was a Revolutionary War veteran. Uh, he had come here in 1807 or 8 as part of a survey crew for the Firelands, which was land that was compensation for British, uh, you know, burning of towns in Connecticut during the Revolutionary War. And that went kind of across Pennsylvania and across Ohio to about this point, and they were surveying that land. He became so enamored with the Sandusky Bay and this part of the the uh, the Great Lakes that he came back in 1909 with his wife and bought 113 acres and began began farming. The War of 1812 kind of interrupted that, and they were forced to uh, to flee for a, about a year and a half. They went to a, a new settlement called Cleveland, which had a population of under 600 at the time. Hmm. Uh, came back in uh, you know about 19 or 1813, uh, after the Battle of Lake Erie, and his his cabin had not been burned, mysteriously, but he decided they needed something more permanent, so he commissioned um, the man who built the lighthouse to build him a stone cabin. It's about two and a half miles from the lighthouse, but that was their private residence. There mm -hmm. was a keeper's house at the lighthouse itself, but we're not sure what the living arrangements or the travel arrangements uh, between the two really were. So if we could move uh, more to uh, recent history. First of all, when was the lighthouse de-staffed? The light was automated in 19, I think, 56. Um, mm -hmm. During the Second World War or beginning of the war, of course, the Coast Guard took over as the light keeper of record of all the aids to navigation. Although I think they kept the last light keeper on through the war. In about 1946, um, they started staffing the light. Uh, of course, it had been electrified since 1923. The Coast Guard station here in Marblehead is only about a mile from the lighthouse. So that makes it relatively convenient um, you know, for people to, to be stationed here and still operate out of Marblehead, Station Marblehead. And then uh, eventually the Marblehead Lighthouse Historical Society was formed, which you're very much involved with. When, when did that happen and how did that come about? Well, during the 1980s, uh, you know, budget cuts and, and everything, you know, was going on in Washington. And the lighthouse was declared surplus property by General Services Administration. And there were attempts to sell it privately. Uh, the local uh, government wasn't really crazy about that idea. And the proposal finally was to tear it down, burn the keeper's house as a training fire for the local volunteer fire department, and put up a lighthouse that looks very much like Marblehead, Massachusetts. Hmm. Um, a bunch of locals took exception to that decision and formed the Historical Society. And in 18, or 1998, finally kind of brokered the deal between the state of Ohio Department of Natural Resources and the federal government for the state to take it over and make it a state park. Mm -hmm. uh, part of that agreement was that we helped them staff it, which we still do today. Uh, so if we could talk a bit about what uh, people experience when they go there. We are open. The park is open virtually 365 days a year. There is no gate. Mm -hmm. uh, park's only about six and a half acres, but it's a nice view of the lake and everything else. The buildings are open to the public uh, from Memorial Day weekend until Labor Day weekend, uh, from noon until four o'clock. Uh, we conduct tours of all the buildings. Uh, we do charge $3 per adult to climb the tower. Uh, all the other venues in the park are free. That's pretty reasonable, yeah. <laughs> I think. Yeah. And not much you can do for $3 these days. <laughs> I think that's a really good deal to climb a lighthouse for a beautiful view for that much. And uh, again, there is a museum in the Keeper's House, as we've uh, mentioned a couple of times, and you've personally been involved uh, with the exhibits in the museum, right? What yeah, are, what are to, some of the exhibits? Mm -hmm. Well, we have, first of all, we have the, the 1904 lens in there, the bivalve Fresnel lens. It's on display. Um, mm -hmm. It's still owned by the Cars Coast Guard. Uh, they come around every year with their hand receipt to make sure we didn't give it away or sell it. But uh, that is on display prominently. And then uh, you know, a history of the lighthouse and some information on on different classes of lenses and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have a room that is the Marblehead room that uh, talks about the quarry on the center whole part of the center part of the Marblehead Peninsula is a huge limestone quarry has been for 100 years. It's about 3000 acres. 
also have a little little blurb in there that the one of the prominent families was the Clemens family in this town. They were the Corey people and also the first keeper of the life saving station uh, was a son. And they had a distant relative named Samuel Clemens, who uh, we have a, a photo of in there. That was a reunion in the 1930s of all the cousins. So it's kind of an interesting little connection to Mark Twain. Yeah. Then we have another room that <clears throat> at one time was the life saving station. Uh, exhibit. And when we built the new building, that was empty. And so we decided to do a photo gallery in there. We have a lot of our volunteers who are pretty good photographers. Uh, plus, it is the, the lighthouse itself is rumored to be the most photographed piece of architecture in the state of Ohio. So we get a lot of people here with serious camera equipment. Hmm. So we have about 20 photos in there on display. They are for sale if you want to contact the photographer. We're not selling them through the gift shop or anything, but we tried right. to make them not a bunch of photos of the lighthouse because there's one right outside, but kind of what it's like to live in this area. Um, yeah. You know, freighters and ferries to Cedar Point, and, you know, that kind of thing. When you say it's the most photographed piece of uh, architecture in Ohio, the thing that sprang to mind, I was trying to think of, could there be anything else that would be close? The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum kind of popped <laughs> well, into my head. Couldn't be any more different, but it is an interesting piece of architecture. It is. Uh, there are a couple of them. The, the Great Lakes Science Center is over there. Um, they have a, a, a freighter that's in the water that you would, has museum. I, I know that for a fact because my company did a lot of the museum exhibits in that freighter. So, you know, yeah. I spent time there too. But uh, this is a kind of a unique lighthouse. Um, you know, there are other lighthouses along the lake. This is the only one you can climb on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago the uh, the life-saving station, uh, which uh, has actually been reconstructed. Yeah, in 1878, uh, there were six life-saving stations built across the Ohio, Ohio shore of Lake Erie, and Marblehead was one of them. Um, it actually, the building actually sat where the Coast Guard station is today, about a mile west of the lighthouse. And in 2015, we, the Historical Society, thought it would be, you know, interesting to build a replica of that life-saving station. The building itself was torn down in 1921 to build the second Coast Guard station. So we contracted an architect, and we had a lot of photos of the building. And during that summer, we built the replica, opened it in a Memorial Day of 2016. And we turned that into a museum, which I did, you know, most of the interior work on. We have a replica of a beach apparatus cart. We also spent seven years restoring a 1931 Coast Guard surf boat that was mm. actually a boat that served in Chicago. We found it sitting in a peach orchard up on Catawba Island, rotting away and wow. talked the owner into giving it to us, which didn't take a lot of arm twisting. Uh, and spent about sixty thousand dollars in seven years restoring the boat. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a beauty, and as we have sure. it sitting on a marine railway going out onto the ramp, the ramp does not go into the water, but we want to show people you know, how it works. Yeah, we have a lot of other exhibits about the U.S. Life Saving Service, the Coast Guard, the Great Lakes, and you know, in general, in that building too. We've had about one hundred fifty thousand people go through it in the. Well, it's been open for six seasons, but it was only open five years because of COVID. Well, that's great. Speaking of that, since you just mentioned it, see, are you fully reopened at this point? And we're speaking uh, on September 24th, 2021. Uh, what's the situation with that? We have been fully open all of this season. Uh, mm -hmm. We were not open at all last year. We, we tried to open on a limited, limited basis, but the state just didn't think it was worth the, the risk. This year on Memorial Day, we opened as usual. And as a matter of fact, we've had record crowds all year. I don't know mm -hmm. how much of that's COVID backlash or, or what, but right. we have been very busy all season long. Yeah, I think a lot of places have, uh, because there's still a lot of places that haven't reopened, but the ones that have, I think, have been pretty busy. There's also something called the Walcott House. I think it's also sometimes called the Keeper's House. What, what is that? That leads to a lot of confusion. <laughs> yeah, uh, It is the keeper's house. It was the private residence of Benajia Walcott, the first keeper. Uh, mm -hmm. It was built about two and a half miles from the lighthouse. That is actually operated by the Ottawa County Historical Society, not our group. But of course, the you know because it was the first keeper, they're very closely tied together. 
that is open in not as many hours as we are. You know, the volunteers, that becomes the problem, you know, to have enough people to, sure. to open the house. It is one of the oldest houses dated 1821 in this part of the state of Ohio. It was built wow. the same year as the lighthouse was. Yeah, it must confuse people. They probably say, well, how did, why did the keeper live so far from the lighthouse? Exactly. And, and as I said earlier, we don't know what his daily routine might have been. I know he had 113 acres and farmed here. Um, so we don't know what he did. There's no record that we've ever found of, of the way they moved back and forth. But it's a good thing that house was uh, preserved. Is there anything we haven't covered at the light station itself that people get to see besides the, the lighthouse? Well, we have a little, little carriage house, which dates to the, the late 1800s. And in that, we have some wildlife exhibits uh, and showcases. We also have a, a video loop and a few chairs there. We have a lot of people that that don't feel comfortable or can't physically climb the tower. So we have a, a drone video that was shot a couple of years ago that gives people a very good feeling for what it's like to stand on top. Plus, we yeah. have some video by one of our volunteers of climbing the stairs themselves. So that that runs and, and you know gives people a, a feeling for something they might not have been able to physically do. Yeah, that sounds great. It's a really good idea. And again, uh, as we've said a couple of times already, that the, uh, the lighthouse is in a state park, uh, the uh, Marblehead Lighthouse State Park. Is that, is that the correct yes, title? Yes, it is. Park? That's yeah. what it is called. Yeah, I know it's not real big. It's something like nine acres, right? I think, um, yeah, about nine. They well, added on to it, took the original property and expanded it about 10 years ago. I think it's actually mm -hmm. the second smallest state park in Ohio. Uh, the uh -huh. smallest one okay. being out at, at Put-in Bay uh, on one of the islands, not far, about 10 miles from here. Yeah, well, it's uh, quality, not quantity <laughs> in terms of its size. Uh, is there anything else there uh, for people to do at the state park besides the, the light station? We have great views of several islands and the city of Sandusky. Um, we have probably two dozen picnic tables. The state permits fishing off the rocks there. We get quite a few people that, that come to fish. We have, you know, about 100 parking spaces, paved parking spaces. So there is, you know, considerable parking area there. You know, just sitting back and relaxing and watching the boat traffic go by. This is one of the most heavily trafficked boating areas in the Great Lakes. And mm -hmm. you don't have to wait more than about 30 seconds for a boat to go by. <laughs> In that sense, it reminds me of Marblehead, Massachusetts. The Marblehead Lighthouse in Massachusetts is in a park. Uh, that where people like to sit and watch the passing sailboats, Marblehead, Massachusetts, being one of the yachting capitals of the country. A pretty broad uh, sailing representation here too. I, mm -hmm. my wife and I sailed for a, a lot of years. Now we're, now we're power boaters. But uh, Sandusky Sailing Club right across the bay and Cedar Point uh, amusement park is very visible about three miles away, and they mm -hmm. have allegedly the largest number of roller coasters of any uh, amusement park in the country, maybe in the world. They, I think they have 21 roller coasters. Holy they dub themselves the roller coast. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, I'll, I'll probably pass on that. I'm not a big roller coaster guy. <laughs> I'm not anymore either. <laughs> yeah, I, I never really was. They didn't, they didn't agree with me too well, but definitely not now. But that's that's amazing. So uh, let's talk a bit about the, some of the other things your group has done, like uh, restoration work, re renovation slash restoration work to the, the lighthouse and other buildings. I believe the lighthouse tower itself had a recent renovation. Yes, in the last it did. Couple in, years. 2000, in 2019 and, and early 20, uh, the state, uh, that was strictly paid for by the state. They uh, uh. Tuck pointed a lot of the stone, took off some of the stucco where there were places that was uh, soft be beneath it fixed all of that, repainted the entire tower, and also completely redid the lightning grounding system within the tower. Uh, mm -hmm. The tower was actually wrapped in scaffolding for about six months in, in Visqueen, and it looked like a big hot dog with the red top sticking out the end. <laughs> <laughs> then mm -hmm. last year, uh, our historical society paid for the construction of a new restroom building um, that was a joint project with the, with the state. We paid for the building and getting the utilities there, and they took care of the site, site work, the paving of the new parking lot and uh, the sidewalks and everything else. That, that project replaced two porta potties that had been there for 20 years. 
Um, we were thinking of having a decommissioning ceremony last April when we tore the porta potties down, but we didn't think anybody, <laughs> we didn't think anybody'd come. <laughs> right. So I this think you're is probably a, right. This was a, a fairly expensive project. It's a very nice facility, but the first seventy thousand dollars were grinding solid rock for a thousand feet to run the utilities in, which took three months. I think the guy who sat in that backhoe for three months, eight hours a day, is about out of recovery now. <laughs> huh. Wow. Uh, so the building is that building, the restroom building is not a reconstruction of a historic building. Right? I mean, I know they didn't have restrooms there years and years ago. <laughs> we told the architect we wanted to blend in with the other buildings. Uh, most of our buildings are a, a, a late Victorian, you know, it's a slightly Victorian flair, a little bit of gingerbread on them. He actually used the roof line from the uh, 1921 Coast Guard station right down the Clip Gable design right down the road. Mm -hmm. And we tried to make it blend in and not stand out. We were going to put a red standing seam metal roof on it, which a lot of lighthouse buildings had. But the state historical preservation people said, no, it, it is a gray shingle roof. <laughs> the reason I asked is that I have seen pictures and it does it looks like it blends in pretty well. It reminds me of some maybe fog signal buildings and that type of thing. At some, Yeah, it kind of has that you. look. Let me ask you, are there any other uh, renovation or restoration projects in the in the pipeline at this point? I think the one we're looking at next year is the 200th anniversary of this lighthouse. I think one little project we're looking at, as I mentioned earlier, is opening up that small limestone quarry that's, or at least a part of it, that's on the, the site, putting a fence around it, doing some outdoor, you know, graphic panels to talk about quarrying and its, you know, its importance in this Marblehead area. That's not going to be a, a huge project, but I think it might add a little bit of interest for some visitors. As you just mentioned, next year is the 200th anniversary of Marblehead Light Station. Do you have anything in the works already for that? We have as as, hmm. kind of under the, the Lighthouse Historical Society, we have formed a community-based committee representing government, churches, um, service clubs, a bunch of folks to talk about how we want to celebrate this in the village. We have had six meetings now. We are putting, we have contracted two musical groups for concerts in the park. Um, we have a big band group from Akron, Ohio, uh, doing a concert on June 18th. We have the Fireland Symphony Orchestra, which is a 60 piece orchestra doing a July 2nd concert. We are still kind of talking with the Coast Guard band about doing something during Coast Guard week. Not mm. sure we can get the entire band. We may have a, uh, a smaller group. We're also talking, since this is Ohio State University country, <laughs> talking to the Ohio State uh, University alumni band about possibly doing a concert in the park here too. Then we're talking about some you know, intermediate maybe middle of the week events, showing some movies in the park, maybe, you know, some Coast Guard theme movies, The Guardian, uh, Finest Hour, that kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And one other idea we have, we're going to try it out in the next couple of weeks to make sure it's, we don't kill anybody, is I climb the light at night, let, letting groups of 15 or 20 people climb up at night and get a feel for what it might be like to, you know, work in that lighthouse, trying to carry yeah. oil up there and maintain it at night. Uh, yeah. We thought we might do that three or four times during the summer if we can do it safely. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet that'll be a big attraction. I know at, at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse here, we we have occasional nighttime tours. Actually, we call them haunted tours. So there's certain things we we talk about on those. But but even for people who might not you know buy into any of that stuff, to be there at night is a really special thing to climb. We have a lot of people night. here at night, and a lot of people in in the winter at night. You know, we get periodic ice shoves since we have 200 miles of open lake toward buffalo and we get a nor'easter uh, much like you do in new england it comes right down that lake and it can shove ice up 15 or 20 feet on the lighthouse uh, yeah. so people come to see that when it happens oh, that, yeah yeah well of course we've all seen uh ice pictures around a lot of the lighthouses on the great lakes we don't get that so much on the ocean here with salt water it tends to happen more you have the the fresh water at the lakes uh, so one thing we haven't mentioned about the uh, the light station, another element of what's there is the gift shop. Uh, that's in the museum building, right? That is in the Keeper's House Museum, yes. it's uh, yeah. Last year, since we couldn't open, we photographed all our merchandise and put the gift shop online for the first time and had 
you know, a fairly good result. At least it, it gave us a little income for the last year. Uh, yep. This year, the sales have been almost double what our best year was ever. We did wow. some remodeling inside, uh, changed some displays, and and greatly upgraded the uh, the merchandise. Um, a mm -hmm. lot more specific Marblehead Lighthouse merchandise that isn't available you know, anyplace else. Uh, plus, just generally, you know, a, a higher level and a lot of more a lot more local artists um, yeah. merchandise. Mm -hmm. It sounds good. So the online gift shop is still happening, right? So if people can't get there physically, they can they can look at the online gift shop. They can go to our website uh, and there's a tab up there for gift shop. And that opens up, you know, all of the merchandise, you know, and we ship it. Yeah, It's done through an eBay shop kind of a thing so that sure it makes it a little easier on us. Yeah, I was actually looking at, at some of that. And speaking of merchandise, I believe there's been at least two books written about Marblehead Lighthouse. I think one is by James Prophet, another one by Betty Nidecker. Are those books still available? Yes, uh, we reprinted the, the Nidecker book a couple of years ago. That one was a limited edition. And to our knowledge, we were the only ones selling it. Uh, it may still be the case. I know we have uh, quite a few of them. The Profit book, I think, is available on, on Amazon as well as through our gift shop. Uh, mm -hmm. James is a local historian and um, did a very good job with with the book. Yeah, well, they both look really good. So uh, those and the other merchandise you're talking about is available, again, both at your gift shop on the site and on the online gift shop on the website. And what is the website for the Lighthouse? Oh, it's one of those really long Marblehead Lighthouse Ohio dot org. All That's not too bad. You know, blend, blended together as one big word. Sure. A, a Google search usually gets us in the one first one or two you know yeah. entries. So right. Marblehead Lighthouse Ohio is not too bad. I've heard much, much more uh, complicated uh, URLs <laughs> for websites. Tell me about the commemorative brick program. What's that all about? How can people order a brick? About yeah, 12 years ago, um, the director, our, our boss, who was actually the manager of East Harbor State Park, which is about five miles from here, suggested that maybe uh, as a fundraiser for our group, we could you know, offer commemorative bricks. The state offered to do the concrete work for a, a compass rose that's about 30 feet in diameter. We started selling those bricks. There were about 650 available there. And since then, we've added a path to the life-saving station. And I think at this point, we've sold about 1,400. Mm. We are about to add two more paths, um, partially to make every building accessible for wheelchair you know, on hard surface, but it also gives us more bricks to sell. Yeah. So yeah. We're, we're looking at doing that uh, this fall and, and next spring to add those additional paths. Those mm -hmm. bricks are available, again, on our website. There's a tab that says bricks. There's also a, a, a brick finder on there. It, it takes you to a spreadsheet and you can search that by anything it says on the brick, who purchased it, anything else. And it gives you a general location to, to finding. it. I know that's been a successful fundraiser for some other lighthouse groups as well. And pretty close to where I am here, uh, Plum Island Lighthouse in Newburyport, Massachusetts has a similar program uh, with bricks around the lighthouse. A lot of people love lighthouses and they get very attached to one if they're, you know, from that area and they just, they like to have, you know, that, that commemorative thing. Plus we have a lot of weddings here that people commemorate with bricks. Mm. So let's talk about what's about to happen. Again, we're recording this on September 24th. People are going to be hearing this on October 3rd. This podcast episode is being released on October 3rd, but then a few days after that, on October 9th, you have your annual festival. Uh, I've seen it referred to as the Lakeside Marblehead Lighthouse Festival or just Marblehead Lighthouse Festival. Uh, can you tell me about that? What goes on at that? We have been doing this for a number of years. We open the lighthouse for extended hours. We open it at nine in the morning instead of noon and go until four o'clock. In many cases, the Coast Guard uh, from Station Marblehead brings one of their ice boats down here. It's kind of like a swamp buggy with a fully enclosed cabin on it that they use when the lake freezes for the ice fishermen that end up stranded out there. <laughs> they also usually bring their boats by. They have two 45 footers and a couple of 29 footers. When they're not on a call, they kind of park them out off the lighthouse for that day. 
then uh, next door at uh, the, the church there, they have a craft festival next door to the park. The village of Marblehead, all the shops have, you know, specials and sales and everything else. Then the little community of Lakeside, which is about a mile west of Marblehead, it's a is actually a Methodist community. It's a Chautauqua, if you're familiar with Lake Chautauqua in upstate New York, very similar thing. Mm -hmm. It dates back to 1873 when it was founded. It is normally a gated community, um, but they open the gates for that day and they have a lot of craftsmen in there and their shops are open. So it kind of, you know, spills out in the whole community. Yeah, well, that sounds really good. So again, that's October 9th and that's pretty much all day? All day, on that time? yes. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned earlier also some of the things you have planned for the 200th anniversary next year. Anything else uh, in the in the pipeline as far as events go at this point? Well, one of the things we've talked about is doing silhouettes, cutouts of the 15 civilian lighthouse keepers. We had two female keepers here. Rachel Walcott was the first female light keeper on the Great Lakes. We only have uh, images for about four of them. But we have come up with a couple of kind of generic life-size silhouettes, a male and a female. We're going to put a little bit of copy about that person on each one. And then the merchants in Marblehead have decided they want to sponsor them for the summer and have them at their uh, place of business, either inside or outside. And we're talking mm -hmm. about uh, then sponsoring kind of a scavenger hunt. You know, you, you take a selfie or we do a, a geocache kind of a thing. If you find all 15, your name goes in, you know, in for a drawing or whatever. And mm -hmm. then maybe move those later on. We have a path through the wooded area, maybe making a keeper's walk. Uh, we would do them, you know, would make them to be a permanent outdoor signage. I love the idea. Maybe after the next summer, we'll, we'll like I said, we'll move them to the lighthouse and yeah. uh, then install them there permanently. Uh, and you mentioned weddings at the station. Uh, you, so you have frequent weddings. Is that right? I, I would guess maybe 50 a year. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's it's a very popular place. Um, uh, permit for that has to be uh, obtained from East Harbor State Park. Uh, we have some weddings that are official and some where people just kind of stop by with a minister and it's very quick. People are generally very courteous of weddings. It's kind of an added attraction when you're there. You get to watch a wedding too. Yeah. Once in a while, we have, uh, you know, music along with them. <laughs> mm -hmm. You yeah. just hope for good weather. Yeah. And of course, in the spring here, it's always a gamble because with cold lake water, our air temperature is more dependent on wind direction than it is anything else. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing here at our local lighthouse, Portsmouth Harbor. We do have occasional weddings there, and any time of year, you have no idea, no idea what the weather's going to be. Exactly. So I have one final question for you, okay? This is for bonus points or extra credit, <laughs> okay? Uh, what have you personally enjoyed most about your association with Marblehead Lighthouse? I think uh, given the fact that Marblehead has a permanent population of about 1,000, it's really a small town. We have one of the busiest Coast Guard stations on the Great Lakes and one of the oldest lighthouses on the Great Lakes. It really is kind of the, the heartbeat of this little community. And to get involved with that uh, has been very rewarding. Uh, you know, I grew up in, my wife and I both grew up in central Ohio, you know, surrounded by cornfields. And I was really never even at Lake Erie until I was in college. You know, my first exposure was to, to the lake was in college and, you know, my wife and I both fall in love with it. And I think also meeting people, you know, we, my wife and I volunteer quite a bit during the summer and meeting people from around the country and around the world that had no idea that the Great Lakes were as big as they are. <laughs> right. And we had lighthouses and things, you know. People just don't realize they're inland oceans. They're, they're One fifth of the fresh surface, fresh water on the planet is in these five uh -huh. lakes. From everything I can see, you and everybody with the Marblehead Lighthouse Historical Society and the, the state that's involved there, uh, everybody's doing a great job. It looks absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's nice seeing the, the work that's been done there in the last couple of years. And uh, we'll have to uh, maybe do this again next year when it's your 200th anniversary. We can but, tell you uh, what mistakes we made. <laughs> Well, I don't know about that. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be great. Uh, so I look forward to hearing more about that. But I really appreciate you spending this time with me today. And uh, again, it's a, it's a beautiful and very historic light station. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Thank All you. Right.
To learn more about Marblehead Lighthouse, visit marbleheadlighthouseohio.org. There's also information about Marblehead Lighthouse State Park on the website of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources at ohiodnr.gov. I'm on a letter shot. I want to remind people to check out the website for the brand new California Lighthouse Society, which is a chapter of the U.S. Lighthouse Society. That website is calighthousesociety.org. Again, California Lighthouse Society at calighthousesociety.org. Also, I should mention that when this episode of the podcast comes out, I will be helping to lead a U.S. Lighthouse Society tour in Maine. I think I'll be seeing some of our listeners on that tour. I hope so. I'm really looking forward to getting back to some of the main lighthouses on this trip. It's been uh, more than two years for most of them. They're like old friends to me. Aww. Speaking of travel, the Chinese philosopher Confucius once said, quote, Wherever you go, go with all your heart, unquote. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast with your podcast app of choice. And if you listen through a platform that permits reviews, please rate and review us. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light.